Have you ever wondered what if the Titanic didn't sink? What if it was her sister ship Olympic? Although this disaster was over a hundred years ago, through a series of videos we will show how it affects you today. This large insurance scheme caused a massive ripple effect of global deception and allowed the elites the ability to control the masses. We only ask that you keep an open mind and decide for yourself. We should start with the RMS Olympic which was ordered in 1907 by White Star Lines, built by Harlan and Wolf and completed on May 31, 1911. The Olympic cost $7.5 million or $187.5 million today, an incredible cost with so much to lose. Edward Smith captained the Olympic's maiden voyage on June 14, 1911, leaving Southampton and arriving in New York on June 21. While docking in New York, the tugboat O.L. Hollenbeck got caught in Olympic's backwash, spun around, collided into her, and was temporarily trapped under her stern. Three months later, Olympic, under the control of the same captain, was in another accident, but this time it was anything but minor. Olympic collided with HMS Hawk off the Isle of Wight on September 20, 1911. The Olympic suffered severe damage, which included two large holes above and below the waterline, steel plating dislodged on over four decks, damaged the starboard propeller and shaft, as well as bent the keel of the ship. After the accident, Olympic made it to the port of Southampton for immediate but temporary repairs before limping to Belfast for a more permanent fix. Any accident at this time that involved a royal military ship was investigated by Her Majesty's Admiral Team. Although the details and eyewitness accounts showed that HMS Hawk was to blame, the Admiral's team declared that it was obviously Captain Edward Smith's fault. This was a financial disaster, as the blame went to Olympic and insurance refused to pay for the repairs. These repairs were going to cost White Star Lines approximately $2.5 million or $60 million today. The bending of the keel caused the ship to list to port, a slight lean to the left. This is something that is very important to remember. In order to expedite the repairs, Harlan and Wolf delayed the Titanic so they could use the starboard propellers in the Olympic. She was back in service November 29, 1911. In February of 1912, same captain lost a propeller blade on the way to New York and once again limped back to Belfast. This was devastating as it showed that the Olympic may not be repairable. This is where it gets interesting. But first, let's briefly discuss a little about the Titanic. To do this, let's go back to a previous picture. This is a picture of the Titanic after leaving dry dock, but before the completion. There are a few things that we need to pay close attention to. First, notice the portholes. The Titanic was made with 14, and the Olympic was made with 16 of these. Now notice the second deck. The windows, they are evenly spaced, whereas the Olympic has variations. Lastly on this picture, I need you to pay close attention to the upper deck. The upper deck is completely open with no promenades in place. Now let's take another close look at the Olympic. Notice the 16 portholes at the front of the ship, as well as the uneven spacing on the second deck. There are not many clear pictures, so we just ask that you pay attention to the outlines, as there will be better pictures, but further away later. Finally, notice the top deck promenades. On the Olympic, not Titanic. Two ships nearly identical, which would be a fairly easy task to switch. Press wasn't around the docks, photography was in its infancy, all dishes and linens were interchangeable between ships, letterheads and menus could easily be changed, the nameplates on lifeboats, 48 life belts, and names of the ships could have easily been swapped in a weekend. If only the two ships were at port at the same time. Oh yeah! They were together in Belfast for a week prior to the Titanic's departure. All of this could have easily taken place. But why would they switch the two ships? Could it be to purposely sink one for insurance reasons? We have to realize that White Star Lines was heavily invested in the building of three sister ships, the Titanic, Olympic, and Britannic. They were in serious financial trouble and the only finished ship was constantly needing repairs. But would they really be willing to take so many lives for money? Well, what if they thought there was a foolproof plan to rescue all the passengers? Now we must discuss one more ship, the SS Californian. 
The SS California was a Leland Line steamship, which was part of the J.P. Morgan's International Mercantile Marine Company. This was captained by Stanley Lord and left Liverpool, England for Boston, Massachusetts five days prior to the Titanic's maiden voyage. During this time, there was a coal strike in England, and coal was very expensive and most steamships were very careful in only making very important trips across the ocean and would never leave without full cargo. However, the Californian left without any passengers and only carried a large shipment of wool and sweaters. At 7 p.m. or four hours before the Titanic sunk, Cyril Evans, who was the Californian's wireless operator, signaled to all ships in the area the location of all the icebergs. At this moment, Captain Lord decided to stop the ship and said they would continue in the morning. Normally at this time, they would have continued through the ice, or if too dangerous, continue on at half speed, especially on such a clear night. Why would he stop? Why during this coal strike would there not be any passengers and only a cargo of sweaters? Before continuing more on the Californian, let's find out what the Titanic is doing at this point. The Titanic's wireless operator, Harold Bride, received the Californian icebergs warning and delivered the locations to the bridge at 10.20 p.m., almost three and a half hours after the warning was sent. Why did it take so long to deliver this message to the bridge? They were approximately 15 miles away from the signal, so they would have intercepted within seconds after the signal was sent. The ship didn't hit the iceberg until 11.40 p.m., so they still had the locations of the icebergs for an hour and 20 minutes. During this time, the Titanic changed course as if heading closer to the icebergs. During the later inquiries, we find that the ship strayed approximately three miles off course. Also at these inquiries, we find that the skies were clear and the icebergs large enough to sink ships could have been seen from eight miles away which would give the Titanic approximately 15 minutes to easily avoid danger. At 11.40 p.m., the Titanic's lookout, Frederick Fleet, spotted the iceberg only seconds before the Titanic hit. Why did the Titanic switch courses as much as three miles towards the ice? And why on such a clear night did the iceberg not get spotted? Let us once more go back to the Californian. At 11.10 p.m., Captain Stanley Lord and 3rd Officer C.V. Groves observed the lights of a ship to the south about 10 to 12 miles away. Captain Stanley runs to the wireless room to find out if Evans knew of any ship in the area. He did, only the Titanic. And then he instructed Evans to call and inform her that the Californian was stopped and surrounded by ice. A claim that then on-duty wireless operator for the Titanic, Jack Phillips, denied. Jack Phillips was a survivor. At 11.40 p.m., C.V. Groves clearly saw the Titanic as multiple decks were lit up. At 11.50 p.m., C.V. Groves watched the ship's lights flash out, as if she had shut down or turned sharply and that the port lights were now visible. This normally would have been cause for concern, but instead of waking Evans and have him contact the ship directly, Captain Lord tried to use Morse light signals. The problem with Morse Light is that it is only good for five to eight miles. As a captain, he would have known this, but still continued from 11.30 p.m. to 1 a.m. with no response. He refused to wake up Evans, even after Groves informed him that the lights were flickering. At 1.10 a.m., now on duty Second Officer Herbert Stone notified Captain Stanley that the ship had fired five signal rockets. Stanley then asked him what color were the rockets, and Stone replied that he was unsure but he thinks they were all white. Captain Lord instructed the crew to continue signaling the other vessel with Morse lamp and went back to sleep. At 1.50 a.m., three more rockets were seen and Stone noted that the ship looked strange in the water, as if she were listing. At 2.15 a.m., Stanley was notified that the ship could no longer be seen. So he asked one more time, what color was the signal, and again was informed they were all white. We must ask ourselves, why would the captain ignore a ship's distress call for any reason? And why were the colors so important? Ships used identifying colors in the flares, 
White Star Lines used the color white. Knowing that the Titanic was in the area, knowing that the signals fired at one minute intervals meant distress, knowing that your own crew members could see the ship in distress and also knowing that you were the closest ship, why would they not help? Why not wake up Evans and find out in seconds what was wrong? Maybe there was something more important than the insurance money. We will get back to this in a second. At this point, we know one reason of why they would switch the two ships. We also know that they did have the ability to switch them. Now let's look at even more evidence. Lawrence Beasley, a Titanic survivor, and several others noticed a list of port, a slight lean to the left after leaving Southampton, very similar to the Olympics list. Let's also take a quick look at this picture. This is the clearest image of the Titanic side view. We know this is the Titanic as if you look at the bow of the ship, here, and zoom in, we can make out a few letters, T-I-T-A. Now let's go back to the overview of the Titanic and pay attention to the second deck evenly spaced windows. Also pay attention to the open upper deck with no promenades. Let us now take a look at actual photography of the sunken ship. Look at the propeller. We can see a stamp of 401. The Olympics number was 400, and the Titanic's was 401. However, after the HMS Hawk collision, they took Titanic's starboard propeller and placed it on the Olympic. Watch this original clip of the Titanic leaving Southampton. This is the supposed Titanic backing out away from port. In the exact location of HMS Hawk collision, we see unusually colored steel plates. Let's take a snapshot real quick. Do you see the discolorization right here? Why would this ship have repairs on its maiden voyage? Finally, notice on the second deck the unevenly spaced windows and the promenades in the upper deck. This is the Olympic. Many people will contest what you see here, but we tried only to provide factual information and left anything out that we felt could be interpreted as fake or false information. Everything that we have found is freely available on the internet with some research. Now remember when we said that this leads to another conspiracy? Well have you ever wondered what if the Titanic wasn't sunk for insurance reasons alone? What if the sinking of the Titanic was for a much more sinister reason? Find out where this leads in our next What If video. Thanks for watching and please subscribe.